Good day and welcome back to True Footy. I know I said these videos would be a bit more few and far between, but in saying that, I didn't expect to finish round one of AFL Fantasy Classic, rank 22 in the entire world. I came into the week thinking that I'd had a, I'd have a pretty solid sort of classic fantasy performance, but I wasn't really too fussed with classic. I put a bit of effort into the team, as I've alluded to, done the video, all that. But I was still heavily prioritised and invested in my fantasy draft league. I pretty much spent most of the last four or five days watching pretty much every game of the round. I couldn't tell you too much specifically, but I sort of generally absorbed all the games as they were happening. And by the Dockers Saints game, I was gone from watching my draft team like a hawk to watching my classic team like a hawk because I. Saw quite a big score building, especially compared to some of my competitors in some head-to-head -head type of classic leagues. So I was sort of pretty optimistic to see what the classic team could do. I started keeping an eye on it. And I was doing that well. By the end, I was cheering for Hayden Young to do well, despite the fact I was versing him in my draft league. Because I had him in classic, I was prioritising his production there, even if it bit me in the arse in my draft league because I'd become that invested in how well I could do this week in Classic. I must say getting distracted by this chase for fantasy success in the last game of the season was quite convenient because it was a nice little distraction from the Dockers shitting the bed, but I digress on that one. I basically think the best bet for this video, because I think it's pretty spontaneous, a bit more unscripted, is that I'm going to sort of just sort of go through my Classic team a bit and talk about why I think it panned out the way it panned out and also go for a couple of some of the potential early trades I'm thinking of pulling off before round two, obviously subject to team selections and all that stuff. Firstly, I'll touch on the big mystery of the last video I did because I still had Elliot Yeo in my team because I'd recorded the video before he'd gotten injured and was pulled out of the team. I did, however, replace him with Bradley Hill, St Kilda man, under the new man Ross the Boss who he's played with before and has performed exceptionally well when Ross lines his coach. So I felt that was a pretty reasonable sort of player to switch Yo into. Brad Hill is someone who's been on a few of my lists throughout the draft process and everything as well. So I was quite happy to pull the trigger on him. And I was even more relieved to see him get an 82, especially considering his break even 78. So that means I'm all good for him. I can move other pieces and hold on to him for a few more weeks until Elliot Yo comes back or something better arises. As for the rest of my backline, it's pretty sort of self-explanatory. It's the same backline basically as the preview video. Sam Doherty, as I've said several times, I think is the premium key back. And he started it off dead on average with his 110. I also said I thought Nick Dacos and Hayden Young both have considerable upside. They've both showed that, scoring in the one teens respectively. I also have to note that I did use the old emergency trick where I brought in Will Gold to... Basically emergency in Ruben Jimby because I had him on my bench and I really wanted that 92 score in my team. And the fact it was round one and I had the luxury of all those extra trades made that an easy decision for me. Overall, I was quite happy with my midfield. All my premium guys played to a premium standard. Clayton Oliver did his usual. He was a good captain, got me a respectable double. Kept me, obviously, obviously more than kept me amongst it. It sort of helped push me up towards the top there. I was also happy to see Chaddy Warner exhibited that he's on that track to step up to that premium midfielder level, so that investment in him for a bit cheaper feels good. However, I must say that Jai Newcomb in that similar conversation and price range was a bit underwhelming. However, I was fine with that considering I had a couple of his cheaper Hawks teammates in my midfield as well in McKenzie and Warple who both well and truly exceeded expectations for their dollar value. I must say that Jai Newcomb, sort of as the way this team's played out this week, has sort of definitely become a top contender for me to trade him out this week, I think. I think, based on what I saw watching the Hawks game, there's going to be a lot more mouths to feed in that Hawks midfield, and I already have significant investment in that in Warple and McKenzie. However, those two are going to appreciate more, whereas Newcomb, at his current pricing, feels a lot more questionable whether he appreciates or depreciates. So I thinking it might be a good idea for me to get out of him and reduce my Hawks stocks at the same time. Speaking of trading out Newcomb, I've, because of excessive Hawks, I'm also going to lean into my rucks, specifically Lloyd Meek, who plays for Hawthorne. He was 
pretty he broke even on his price, but the upside that I thought was there didn't really appear to be as evident as I'd hoped to be in the first game. And I think that because of the John Newcomb overinvestment in the Hawks situation, I think I could use this as a potential opportunity to upgrade Meek into a Sean Darcy, a Tim English, a Rowan Marshall type of ruck. I'm still to be decided. I'm recording this reasonably early Monday morning. I've got a bit of time to make that decision. But at this stage of the game, I'm thinking upgrade Meek to a premium ruck, borderline premium ruck, and then use the Newcomb cash to pay for something else down the track and turn him into another cash cow. Continuing on with the rocks, I am very happy to have seen my boy Jared Witts, who I've raved about repeatedly, sort of have an explosive game at the absolute top of his scoring range, which really helped me both in draft and classic. I have sort of didn't really expect him to hit the peak of his range like this so soon. You know he has sort of one game a year where he probably gets to this point. He's got it out of the way early, but I still think from now on he'll be consistent 80 to 100, 110 type of player for the rest of the season. And I'm happy just having him sit on my team, as I've alluded to. As for my forward line, I was did really well, I think, and I was just sort of probably lucky in a way that I didn't have the extra cash at the end to invest in Dunkley as another premium forward, which would have definitely hurt my ranking this week, considering he had a bit of a whiff. Although I will say this as a quick aside to those of you who do own Dunkley, I do still think that he is a great fantasy asset, and unless you really don't have any other better trades you think that can improve your team, I I personally would hold on to Dunkley for a few more weeks, just sort of let the law of averages sort of play out with him and sort of reevaluate from there rather than panicking and selling him now. I must give a shout out to my boy Harry Sheasel. I'm just spewing I had him on my bench in my draft league rather than starting him, but I started him in Classic, and boy, was that handy. Nice little 118, first ever game. Another thing to note with Sheasel quickly is the dual position potential because he played off halfback this entire game, so I imagine by the first position reorganizations, he'll be given that dual position allocation as a defender as well as a forward, playing that Nick Dacossi halfback flank accumulative type role. In terms of my other forward cash cows, I ended up settling on Luke Pedler and Matthias Philippou in my final cash cow shuffle, seeing who was playing, who I thought would max out of all the guys I had who were playing. And they were both very rock solid. I'll take a 70 from Luke Pedler any day of the week. And although Philippou barely broke even with the 54, from what I saw watching the Saints-Dockers game, I think he does have that scoring upside and could have a few 80 to 100 type games throughout the season, but probably going to be a little inconsistent. So it could be worth riding him and then cashing him out when the time comes. That's about all I've sort of written down. I've sort of thought I'd try and do this video a bit more unscripted, get it out quicker. I've even reduced the quality from 4K to 1080p just so I can smash the edit and upload a bit quicker, keep this one a bit more relevant. But I was just quite surprised to sort of see how well I ended up doing in classic it was really vindicating for all the work I've sort of done in the pre-season preparing for AFL fantasy preparing to make this sort of content it was really vindicating to get that early success and give me something to build on for the rest of the year although I'm sort of no it's early days especially fantasy classic a lot of people a lot of people who beat me might have gotten lucky and just whiffed on a Luke Ryan having a big week or a Brandon Cox or something. I think my team's set up to be pretty consistently as good as it can be, but whether or not it's a top 25 team week to week, it's a lot of variance involved. But I'm just happy to sort of see that I've given myself the right baseline before you're locked into two trades a week to build off and be competitive. And hopefully I can keep leading the true footy league. It'd be pretty good to sort of be the guy yeah i'm making the fantasy videos and backing it up by actually winning the true footy fantasy that'd be good i guess i may as well touch on fantasy draft a little bit as well while i'm doing this video i'll say i won my first round matchup against joycey's vaulted forward line i got lucky dunkley whiffed a little but as a whole my team was definitely a bit up and down I was quite happy to get Doherty's 110 straight off the bat. 
Liam Duggan was a little worse than I expected. I'm slightly worried about him now, but I'm still keen to hold on to him for a while longer and see how that eventuates. Mason Redmond was great. He seems to be getting that role where he gets a bit of that flexibility, a bit of an ability to run around. So I'm quite optimistic he can sort of sustain a nice average for me throughout the year. Him and Dunkley, uh, sorry, him and Doherty being the pillars of my back line where I rotate your Sarge, your Duggins, those sort of dudes around. That's sort of how I've briefly envisioned it going at this stage. As for my midfield, I was very disappointed that none of them cracked a ton. That's just, in a midfield, you need... At least one, two people cracking tons. Like my highest score in the midfield was a ninety-three from Ollie Wines, which I was grateful to have. Watching that game, I was getting a little worried in patches, but he padded the stats a little and got it to a respectable score. Noah Anderson and Amon in particular were quite underwhelming. I was hoping they'd be a lot closer to a hundred than eighty. Let's put it that way. And Brad Crouch was just one of those sort of weird games. I think not many people scored too well, except for Luke Ryan and Brennan Cox, obviously, just intercept mark after intercept mark, kickity, kickity, point, point, point. But yeah, even 90 from Brad Crouch is solid, considering the way that game played, but he's someone, um, as I've alluded to, is hoping in the 110s, borderline, giving me those extra scores above 100 to make up for the guys who inevitably score under 100. I will shout out James Warple on my bench. He did have a great game, and I think he's probably going to, based on what I saw, push Amon out. Maybe have Amon as my emergency because Sam Berry was atrocious for Adelaide. In terms of the ruck, once again, Jared Witts is spectacular. That 137 really, really helped me, especially because his opposing ruckman was Luke Jackson. So just having such a big edge in that position really helped me get the victory this week, I think, against Joycey. As for my forwards, Dylan Moore, 86, that's sort of rock solid, about what you expect. As I said earlier in the classic part of the video, a few more mouths to feed than I expected at Hawthorne. So I'll take an 86 from him in the first game of the season any day of the week. I think he can sort of maintain about that. Probably I might have been overselling it a little, thinking he could push up a level, but if he can maintain that, I'd live with that. Isaac Heaney was quite disappointing with a 64, but the thing is with Heaney, he's prone to a few of those sort of 60, 65, 70 type of games here and then. But that's about as low as his scoring will get. He's not one of these guys who will just have an absolute howler and score you like 45 or something. Heaney's sort of pretty consistent in that 60 to 120 range, which you can live with, but you're sort of hoping he's a lot closer to the 80, 100 sort of range than 60, that's for sure. And then finally, I did the old emergency trick to get Jez Cameron in because I knew he was my first forward playing, key forward, as I've alluded to, they're a bit more volatile. So I sort of wanted to see what his score was before I committed to it. Once I saw he had an 85, I was more than happy to just take the guaranteed 85. Even though, in hindsight, if I'd just left Sheasel in there, I would have been better off. But I won regardless. I've got some good assets on the bench in Sheasel, Warple. I've hit on a couple of those guys, which is handy. Most of my starting lineup hasn't been too disastrous little worried about Amon and Anderson, but other than that, it is what it is. There's some solid options on the waivers that I'm thinking about. Before I was so rudely interrupted by my dumbass dog, I was about to go through some of the notable restricted free agents in my draft league that I'm sort of looking at a little this week. There's a few solid defenders there, like Brennan Cox, as I sort of alluded to, I think, has a bit of that Tom Stewart upside in terms of his fantasy style based on the way I saw him play today. But I also know with the Freo backline, week to week, different guys sort of play that intercepty, kicky, rack up fantasy points type of role. So I'd sneak him in on my bench, but I don't think he's the highest sort of priority to pick up. But Brandon Cox, my Dockers bias, is steering me there. Kate Chandler's the free agent in my fantasy draft league. He's someone I'm sure is going to get swooped up. A lot of the a lot of the nerds on Reddit I've heard chatting about him, they're all fans, so I'm sure someone will pick him up. Josh Ward is another one of those Hawks midfielders, could be worth speculating on, but I've already over-invested in that, so I'm probably a bit cool on that idea. Ryan Burns from St Kilda is a forward mid I find quite interesting. Busted out of 94 to begin proceedings. He looked quite good in that game too, so I think he's sort of someone who's going to have a bit of a role for St Kilda. 
give him regular opportunities to score and if you can find someone who has regular opportunities to score fantasy wise in the forward line you take those opportunities and run so Ryan Burns in particular someone I may pick up both McGovern brothers are there as well so there's a few of those intercepty defender types which sort of diminishes the value of going for prioritising a Brennan Cox or something like that there's a few of those sorts floating around so you don't want to overcommit Charlie Constable's another one who interests me. As he was in my classic backline, I was a fan, and I've always been a fan of him since his draft year. So I think Constable, given the opportunity to be a bit of a possession pig, can fulfil that role pretty well. So he's someone else who interests me in the backline. Ruben Jimby as well, young fellow who's going to get plenty of opportunities throughout the year. Pretty readily made body, so he's another one. Basically, my two cash cows from classic. I'm considering in my draft league as well now, in simpler terms. Bobby Hill is another forward, someone who I find interesting. I think he's going to get plenty of opportunities to run and add a bit, inject a bit of speed into that Collingwood team, so I think he'll have enough opportunity to rack up some points. He's someone I may pick up as well. Other than that, there's sort of a lot of standard sort of players who are about the marks who've sort of played well on the weekend to sort of put them towards the top of the free agent list based on their averages but just out of the names I could say the ones I've mentioned are the ones that sort of stand out Callum Ward's an interesting one actually at second glance don't mind the idea of him especially now that that GWS midfield sort of pushed enough people out for him to keep a relevant role but yeah not too much to report on the draft front this week this is sort of more about classic and how I was so bewildered by the fact I'd done as well as I did I sort of thought I'd do better than I have in the last couple of years where I haven't really given a shit about it but to be one of the best players in Australia after round one was just I was bewildered it's awesome it sort of vindicates all the effort and stuff I've put into fantasy Speaking of effort and feeling vindicated, check out Druzy's Athlete Academy. If you want to prioritise your physical and, by extension, mental health, hit up our good friend Druzy. He will come up with a good exercise program suited to your needs and equipment. He will get you sorted. He will get you looking shredded as shit. Check him out. Hope you all enjoyed this quick little update. I hope it's not too far between videos. Especially if I'm doing well, that'll definitely force me to make more videos if I keep doing well. So hopefully I keep doing well in fantasy. Hopefully you all do. Best of luck, everyone. Catch you later.